Whoa, it all went wrong, but we're here now. Um, he was driving. Welcome again back to Puzzle Hack. Uh, we lost that background. Oh, there it is. It is magic. Um, He's still uh, driving. We're back again for another week. Um, Scott, how are you doing? Simon, um, a little surprised at the moment, but I'll get over it. Anyway, uh, doing quite well, doing quite well. I'm having a, uh, a very scary day uh, at work. I am making some major changes to things, and they're all working the first time, <laughs> which is always terrifying because sooner or later yeah, that's going to catch up with you. Yeah, you know, something's going to go wrong, right? <laughs> all right, all right. So, so we're going to do some. Uh, we're going to go through some of the things we didn't get to in the last stream. Uh, so let me just share a little something here. So welcome again to volume two. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, PWAs, and we have some guests coming in. Um, Scott, um, we have some do's and don'ts we should be talking about. Absolutely. Um, short version, be a decent human being. Uh, that includes in writing, in YouTube chat. I realize that's an alien concept to some people. Uh, but yes, be a decent human being in YouTube chat. And, uh, you know, don't post anything. I mean, come on. We all, uh, we're all more than five years old. Don't, oppose, don't post nude stuff, uh, rude stuff, offensive stuff. Don't advertise or promote your business. Say, I'll make your app for five bucks and then run over to the Flutter Community Slack and ask everybody how to write the app. Um, <laughs> we say no. Uh, now, don't put the same question over and over and over again. If you can look at YouTube chat well, and see your same question twice... Without scrolling, you're spamming. To be honest, actually, this week we have a nice Randall in the background who's been going to be capturing all these questions for us, and uh, so we Can won't have to. Them? <laughs> so we won't have to, uh, you know, go over them twice. And uh, just make sure you put a Q in front of your questions so we can see yep. them, and Randall can extract them from the chat. Um, yeah. And One the last, last point. Go on. The last point. Yes, thank you. Um, we share ban lists with a number of the other places in the community. Uh, we all kind of know each other, the people who started all the different things uh, that you go to, the chats and the message boards and the Reddit. Uh, we all worked together in the beginning of Flutter, and we made a deal that we agreed on a set of a code of conduct, and if somebody violates it, then they get kicked from that place, and then the ban list gets shared. So if you are rude enough and offensive enough and nasty enough to get booted out of here, don't be surprised if you suddenly can't log into the Slack anymore or any one of a number of other places. All right. So after all that wise note is gone, let's uh, go on to some introductions. So my name is Simon Lightfoot. I'm a community leader and the CTO at DevEntures London. And you can find me at that Twitter address. Scott, who are you? I think you just told them. No, I am a community leader in Flutter. We've been around for a while. I am also one of the organizers of GDG Cleveland. That's Google Developer Groups Cleveland. And I am a slave at Dev Angels London. <laughs> I work uh, under we, the stairs with Dobby. We have we 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 have another guest with us. Uh, that's Kelvin. I'm gonna I'm gonna tragically probably Boteng. I'm gonna say that's his last name, and he's a product marketing manager at uh, Google. He was here last week. Adriana is going to be joining us. And in the background, we have a Randall, who's a, a Dart and Flutter GDE. He's also our question magician. He's going to be capturing all those lovely questions that, you, uh, uh, that you're that you going to put in chat. And just again, remember, cue in front of your questions. Thank you. So back to uh, back to things. I think we'll bring Kelvin on. Kelvin, I, I think I hear Kelvin in the background. Hey, Hi, everyone. Hi, Simon. Hi, Scott. Uh, thank you guys so much uh, for having me on today um, and for uh, helping us to get the word out about the Flutter puzzle hack. Um, so yeah, my name is Kelvin. As Simon said, I'm a product marketing manager here at Flutter. Um, and yeah, I've been um, working behind the scenes on the Flutter puzzle hack. Um, and I'm so excited. We have almost 4,000 participants so far. Um, and we're getting a peek at almost 2,000 uh, project drafts in, in the works. So I'm really, really excited to see uh, what's being built and, and, and what people are coming up with. Um, just to give a little bit of background on the Flutter puzzle hack. Um, so the idea for the Flutter puzzle hack is that you build a, a slide puzzle um, 
and you there's a sample um, on flutterhack.devpost.com. You take that sample and you create the most interesting, beautiful UI that you can think of. Um, so essentially coming up with the, you know, using all of Flutter's uh, visual capabilities to do something really, really awesome. Um, so I'm really excited to see what folks come up with. But um, since the puzzle actually targets Flutter on the web, um, we thought it would be a really awesome opportunity to bring in um, a web expert um, to talk about uh, you know, the best practices for building PWAs um, and how that might affect uh, your Flutter project. So uh, because of that, I'm really excited to introduce Adriana Jara, who is a developer relations engineer um, for the Chrome Dev team. Hello, welcome to the stream. Hi, thank you. I'm super excited to be here. So in case we missed it, that link at the bottom is where you can go sign up if you haven't already signed up to the Hackathon. And uh, the link is always in the description of all the videos. So if you're seeing this later, you can go find it there, click on that link and uh, get signed up. And uh, there's lots, there's actually uh, uh, under the resources, you'll find example puzzle and things that will get you started. Um, read, make sure you read all the resources. So, and, and just to mention, there is a chance to win one of up to $50,000 worth of prize. Yeah. This is a big deal. Go sign up now. <laughs> Can I so participate? I, we're all excluded, so you know, go, go right ahead. You know, uh, um, so, so um, Adriana, um, I want to. <laughs> yeah. um, I think I think we uh, will leave the stage to yourself, Adriana, and then we'll come back afterwards, and uh, we'll do some general Q and A uh, at the very very end. But in between that, we'll answer any questions at PWAs. I've got a few myself I want to ask you after you've done your presentation. So uh, the floor is all yours and take it away. Sounds good. Um, welcome everyone. We're going to be talking about like what are PWAs, why we care, and a little bit of Flutter, of course. Uh, I'm not an expert on Flutter. I'm an expert on PWAs. So the talk is going to be a little bit more about generalities about PWAs. But then we're going to talk about like what's the current support that Flutter has for PWAs. But before we get started, since uh, there is a chance that not everyone knows what a PWA is, I'll start by defining defining it. Um, so. It's a little bit hard to define what a PWA is because PWA is more of an umbrella term. It is not a rigid concept. Like you cannot point to it and be like, oh, it's a framework and this is the SDK or it is this tool and I use it only like this. It is not a bird, it is not a plane. Um, it's more of like, as I said, an umbrella term and what that umbrella covers it's uh, the description of a set of characteristics that websites can have that uh, provide an app-like experience. And I think we have a problem in the dev community that we don't know exactly what a, a app experience is, but we have gone with it. And basically that's what it's a PWA. It is not owned by a single company, not a single company created. And uh, in the last few years, uh, Google, Microsoft, Samsung, Intel, they have been really, really involved in moving these characteristics to be as a standard and to make it um, available in more and more uh, web browsers. And it is not attached to a single tech stack. It doesn't depend on a single uh, JavaScript framework or a single web framework. It doesn't, it's not attached to you not having a framework at all. Uh, and this flexibility is the thing that allows uh, Flutter to have their own implementation that you can add a PWA to your uh, Flutter app. Um, so, I said a lot of general things. So a little bit more in, in concrete, what is it that we call um, progressive web app and what are the characteristics? And for that, like I'll go through each piece of the name and I'll start with the web because that's the core of uh, progressive web apps. Uh, and the community felt the need to give this characteristic a name to create like a sort of a standard and something that 
uh, people would understand what they're talking about because in the old ways, the web was seen as mostly for displaying content, but there was being this shift of having a really interactive web and having like more and more powerful web experience. Um, but the web is still the heart of PWAs, the under underlying technology when you build a PWA, it is still a website. It has the reach of the web. It is searchable, indexable. Uh, it has the flexibility of the web that it can uh, be built in different technologies. You can host it in different technologies. Um, you have options to build it. It is easy to share. It is at the end still a link and you can share with your friends and your collaborators and all work together. And it runs through a browser. So you still are have like a layer between the platform operating system and uh, your app because the browser covers a lot of um, interactions between the operating system and what your app needs and it also protects the user with its general uh, security and, and privacy uh, tools. So what's the app part of a progressive web app? Uh, it is installable and um, you can have uh, shortcuts in your home screen. It is findable everywhere in your device, however you use an app, once you install this progressive web app, it's hard to differentiate between the other apps. Um, and as I said, like it's hard to define what an app feeling is, but the PWAs have it. Like it, it they run in an independent uh, window from the browser and they look a lot like an app. They have integrations with the operating system, for example, um, on desktop and Android, they can share files, they can share media, they can share text like other apps do. And it is capable as um, other apps too. Like it can have background sync for when the app is not running, it has notifications, it has integrations like handling file systems, um, files directly from the file system. You don't have to upload and download and download every version of the file, but you can directly edit the file in your app if that's something that your app does. So this is the app part of a progressive web app. And then finally, like the progressive part and why it is in the name, um, it was thought because that shift of the web not uh, being only a document display uh, medium by becoming more and more uh, capable, the progressive part is like more and more capabilities are coming to the web and the apps are getting more and more uh, like platform specific apps. Um, it's also the capabilities that are implemented depend on the browser implementation. Not all browsers have implemented all the capabilities uh, yet. So some developers create the PWAs and still have fallbacks for characteristics that have not been implemented in a browser. So the app still works and gets better and better as more browsers implement the capabilities. And it's also it, it was also thought to be progressive in the way that the user interacts with the app, the more the user interacts with the app, the app can ask for permissions and have more uh, integration. And that was thought to be also progressive um, growing to uh, keep the security and privacy of the users. So I hope now you have an idea like everything that the term uh, PWA means. Um, and now like, okay, but what are those characteristics that the PWAs claim that an app has to have to be a PWA? The first one, as I mentioned, it has to be installable. And to be installable right now, uh, the implementation 
on the browsers is like it has to comply with a set of criteria that we'll see in a little bit. And then the browser is going to prompt the user to install the app as an app. Uh, the prompts vary from browser and platform. Uh, on desktop, Chrome, Chrome and Chromium uh, based browsers have like a little icon that appears in the URL, and that's how you can install uh, PWA. And on Android right now, we have a way to have like an enriched install experience. And the prompt is a little bit bigger. It has images. Um, but it, oh, and on um, iOS, you can only install PWAs if you are using the Safari browser. And it is a more manual workflow, and the user has to add the website to their home screen to have the app run uh, as an app. Uh, and finally, once it is installed, it is hard to distinguish it from other apps. As I said, like it has integrations, uh, like shortcuts, like share, like they can even run on a start on a startup on uh, your desktop application. So if you have a chat app that is a PWA, you can set it to run on a startup. And when you log in your computer, it will start automatically. They run on their own window. And in general, uh, users don't know the specifics of a PWA versus a platform specific app. Uh, and here I have the criteria that I was talking about what makes a PWA installable. And uh, you can have like all the details on that QR code. Um, so the web app is not already installed. If it is already installed, the little icon is going to show up. It meets a user engagement heuristic. And nobody is sure like what that heuristic is. But basically, it's not just the user going to your site. It will wait a little bit so that the user interacts with the site a little bit, and then it's going to allow the app to be installable. It has to be served over HTTPS. It has to be a secure domain. That's just a requirement, again, for security and privacy of the users. And it includes a web manifest. And we'll see what a web manifest is in a little bit. That includes those properties. And those are just properties of the web manifest manifest the standard, and it re registers a thing that is called a service worker. And we'll also see what a service worker is in a little bit with a fetch handler. And the fetch handler is just an API for ser service workers. Uh, what other characteristics do PWAs have to, have to have to be a PWA? We went through installable. It also has to be reliable. And this is that app feeling to the user that is hard to define. But um, the people working in the technology have found that one of the factors is like it is fast. It loads fast and it prioritizes content because a lot of platform specific apps are installed as a package with all their assets. The web has like this disadvantage that sometimes it doesn't load so fast. But uh, there have been tools and technology that are being developed so that PWA uh, can load fast and can um, give the user content fast. And they feel that they are opening uh, an app that is installed on, on, the, on their device. Another characteristic of reliable PWAs is they offer some kind of offline indicator if the app cannot um, do the task that it is meant to do, it should let the user know that it has no connection and that they should come back when they are connected to the internet again. It should not show the default browser uh, page not found error. And there is even people that create like a whole experience offline versus just the little indicator come back when you have the internet. Uh, as I said, like we we have been develop, developing tools and technologies for making this possible, for making websites reliable so that they can be PWAs. And uh, some of those technologies are caches and service workers. And the third characteristic for PWAs is they have to be capable. 
And it is like this migration that I have been talking about from displaying documents, displaying content to becoming capable apps. So things that we were not able to do, like editing a file directly online without uploading and downloading um, the files, it's now possible. Uh, VS Code is a PWA, so you can have like a code editor that works seamlessly on the web with these uh, new capabilities. And it might sound like obvious, but uh, they, the PWA should use these advanced capabilities to solve the user need. They should have like this better experience now that we have the capabilities available. And for that, the community has created Project Fugu and it is this set of APIs that have been uh, being implemented to improve the browser's capabilities and create new uh, standards. Um, and it started again uh, at Google, but in the last few years, it has grown a lot and it has had collaboration from other companies like Microsoft and Intel and Samsung and like all these big companies that are interested in the web have been uh, collaborating to create more and more capabilities for the web. Uh, I know that the title of the talk said that it was best practices for a PWA, but uh, that would make the talk uh, too long. So if you're interested in like specifics of what makes like a really good PWA, and what technologies are there uh, available, you can follow that QR code or find that page. And it has like all the criteria for a good, uh, better and a best PWA. Um, I promise we are getting to the Flutter implementation in a little bit, but we still need uh, two more concepts for understanding how the implementation works. And uh, for a PWA to be installable, it needs two fundamental components to comply with that installable checklist. And the first one is the manifest. It is a JSON file that you uh, include in your HTML code and associate it with, with your app. And it basically tells the browser that your website is also an uh, app. And it tells your browser how to display your app. So it includes some properties like the name, the short name that is going to be displayed in home screens, the icons that are going to be the shortcut to access your app, the start URL that launches uh, when the user goes to your app, uh, background color, theme, all of those characteristics. There's a whole spec about everything that you can add to the manifest. And that's one of the components for PWAs. And the second component is the service worker. And as I mentioned, it is this set of APIs that uh, have been created to help developers manage caches and make the loading of web apps faster and also to be able to create offline experience and have the web overcome this restriction that it had that it, it didn't work when things were offline. With the use of caching and service worker and storage APIs, you can implement an experience offline. And the service workers is basically a JavaScript file. And <clears throat> it's an intermediary between your app and the resources that it gets from the network. Basically, the service worker is going to capture those requests. And depending on the guidelines that you implement in your service worker, it is going to decide where it is going to serve that resource from. It might be from the cache. It might be from the network. And there, are, there is a host of patterns that you can use for implementing a fast loading PWA. Um, OK, finally, <laughs> we, got, we got to what's going on with PWAs and Flutter these days. Um, I got this um, little snippet from that page, build, uh, build and release a web app on Flutter. That's on the Flutter documentation. And it basically says that uh, it started on version 1.2. Uh, they did improvements for uh, Flutter 2. 
But basically, when you build your Flutter app, it is going to give you the everything you need to make that web app that Flutter creates installable. It is going to give you everything, all of the basics that you need to make your web site a PWA. So it, you, if you, and we'll see how to do that. When you do the create PWA, you can go to the web folder and there you're going to see the manifest that I just described that is going to make your app installable. Also, it is going to create, when you create the release version, it is going to create the service worker and it's going to associate it with your um, PWA. So how do we build a web app with Flutter? Just in case you have to install the Flutter SDKs and there are instructions on each operating system and you probably know way more than I do about this. Uh, then we update Flutter to have um, the right version and make sure that we're going to get the latest improvements. And then we check with Flutter devices because we need to have Chrome installed for testing and running our app uh, and developing. So we check that uh, Chrome appears as one of the options. And then it is the same as when we create a Flutter app for other platforms. And it is just Flutter create my app. And then I go to my app. And then I do Flutter run and I tell it to run on Chrome. If you don't have any other device attached to your uh, development machine, then you can ignore the minus D Chrome. And that is going to start the PWA <clears throat> and the website that you're going to be developing. And you can test like with any other platform. In that um, QR code URL, you can also find how to create a release build that is going to include the service worker. And also, you will find how to add a web app uh, to an existing Flutter configuration. Uh, now, a little bit of uh, things to be aware when uh, using uh, Flutter to create your PWA. It's that if you're using any plugins for the other platforms, you have to double check if they are supported uh, for the web. And uh, SEO is not awesome on Flutter uh, websites. And uh, we are working, well, the Flutter team is working on it. And you can see more details on that GitHub issue on how to overcome this uh, limitation a little bit. Flutter is not a specific for PWA. Like we, we know this, the strength of Flutter is that it works in multiple uh, platforms, but it, it is worth to note uh, that it is an important thing because since it has to work with other platforms, um, it has more things that are strictly needed for uh, PWAs. Uh, there is not a lot of configuration for your PWA right now. And uh, everything that you need for the PWA is auto-generated, which is awesome because you get a bunch of things out of the box. But if you would like to slightly modify something, that's not a power that you have at the moment. The service worker itself is not optimized yet. But I'll give you the news that my team is working with a Flutter team um, to make it a uh, more optimized uh, service worker. Uh, right now, it might be like the caching is not as efficient, or you might have some issues with installation. Uh, but we're working on making it better and better. Other things to be aware of um, are things that, because Flutter works with multiple platforms, we have to take into account how that translates to the web platforms. Like it usually used to work with mobile platforms, and now we have to deal with uh, big screens that um, maybe don't have touch events. And we need to uh, make sure that we are also implementing keyboard and mouse events so that your website is usable in these big screen devices that don't support touch events. And I found this great article that is called Progressive Web Apps with Flutter. And you can find it in that link or that QR code that has 
the actual code to handling different uh, sizes, uh, checking whether it is a web app that is running, and um, handling those keyboard and uh, mouse bindings. Uh, as the snippet said in the PWA Flutter um, slide, since the support is not complete yet, it's a work in progress. And as I said, like my team, the web uh, developer relations team and the Flutter engineering team are working together. It really, really helps if you can provide feedback on this implementation and what would be more important for you, what would make your experience as a developer easier. So the last part of uh, the title of my talk, like why do we care about PWAs? Uh, both Flutter and PWAs help developers have a single code base that they can deploy to multiple uh, platforms. And uh, they give like a truly multi-platform experience users can have journeys where, where they start doing something on their phones and then they go to the tablet and then they go to the computer and back again and like everything is synced via uh, the web and they can access the app wherever they can access the web uh, the web is becoming more and more capable each day so we are now able to give the users these capabilities and the way the web, the web is an open platform and there are tons of technologies, tons of ways that people can get into it that make the web like an accessible platform for developers to create their ideas and uh, sharing and the reach of the web. It's very big. So that's why we care about having these capabilities on the web. If you want uh, any more information about PWAs in a specific, you can go to web.dev slash progressive web apps. We also have a course that is web.dev slash learn PWA that has a ton of details that teaches you everything about PWAs. And if you prefer your updates in the form of tweets, uh, my handle is Tropicadri. And we also have the Chromium Dev a uh, handle where we uh, post a bunch of things about web. And that's it. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. That was actually really interesting. Um, I I was actually just thinking all the way through that. Um, there are some several points, you know, that, that, um, that have been mentioned there that I think are worth going through. So a PWA is just the idea of this kind of grouping of advanced functionality on the web. So it's not your normal request response. It's almost client interaction. It's also something that you can install onto your browser with using your browser platform as as it, right? Yeah. So progressive web app being sort of like the enhanced web as an application. Yes. Yeah. Um, I hear oh, I, people, I, I hear, I hear I, people. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Kelvin. Sorry, you got kind of left in the back. <laughs> that is, that is okay. <laughs> I, I hear people. He's still describe... driving. Sorry. <laughs> go, go on. <laughs> I hear people describe PWAs as the concept that was HTML5 back in the days. Right. So right. where we want to take the web, that's the concept of a so PWA. I'll be going with web 3.0. We might as well just increase the version, right? Ah, web two, ah. web three. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, I, I was, uh, yeah, so so just to mention that all of our Twitter handles are, are down in the description if you want to follow us. Um, I'm going to share, actually, so the documentation that was brought up on, the, on those things from, from the Flutter website, uh, let's see if I can get this to share. So on the Flutter website, uh, let's see if we can get this to share for everyone. Oh, there we go. Um, Let's see if I can make that a bit bigger. Well, that's about as big as you're going to get with the site thing. So, so yeah, on the left here, so you go to um, uh, you go to the documentation. Uh, yeah, well, okay, yeah, I'm here anyway. So go to the documentation, get started, and then there's two there's two sections. There's building a web app, and that takes you through some of those starting points that were brought up in Adriana's slide. So you have to be on the channel stable and you want to do an upgrade. So you make sure on the latest stable. Am I, Kelvin, am I right in thinking it's still beta Flutter Web, right? It's still considered beta? 
even though it's on stable channel, it's still considered beta, right? If I remember rightly. Um, I believe so. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, right. it's actively being developed, in other words. So your feedback yeah. is always welcome. Um, so yeah, and once you've done that, Flutter devices will then list Chrome as a device. And if you want to target that device to the command line, you do dash D and then followed by Chrome. And you can also do, there's a hidden device called web dash server, I think. And you can actually use that. And it does mean you can use a different browser. However, debugging is not like a thing you can do. You only have, you're going to do debugging through Chrome. So you can test locally in Safari if you need to. Um, and then finally, yeah, there's some, there's some other things down here. There you go. There's the dash D Chrome. And um, when you do Flutter create, you can also specify you only want web, for example. There's, there's a way of doing that. Um, but yeah, so, so follow this guide. And then, uh, of course, those of us that are watching that are web developers, there's a whole section here about, you know, as a web developer, your understanding of web and how that how you can pull that understanding to Flutter. So there's a lot of knowledge in here about sort of the idea about how it transforms and rotations, how you do that with Flutter. So it's kind of like bringing that knowledge to, to Flutter, basically. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to kind of bring that up. The, the, the documentation is around. You can get to it on the Flutter website. Um, right, I think we've got some questions. I'm going to see if I can scooch through some of these. Um, Scott, do you want do you want to control the questions or should I? Uh, I guess I'll dig around and see if I can find something here. Um, scrolling back, scrolling back, scrolling back. So, so you should have told me this first ten, um, <laughs> 10 minutes in we've got um can you can you please you know, fix we've got a couple of this is general ones um well we can't know because we're not on the flutter team i think i think i'd say if you have an issue with this go look at the flutter github repo find the issues search for the issue and if it's not already there document the issue and the team can then fix it but to say in chat, fix this bug is not going to make it happen. Right. right. Um, so, yeah. Raphael, how to make the widget text searchable by control F from the browser. Okay. So I can, I'm going to scooch into this one. Uh, that's because your browser is using canvas kit and not the, there's two, in, there's two types of reading on flutter. There's canvas kit. And then there's, um, uh, web widgets, whatever it's called, um, like HTML. Uh, yeah, there's a there is a, a web page part of the documentation. Uh, there's hang on, lots of web. You there can is, specify the web render when you I, release the app. When you do a Flutter build, you can pass a parameter that is like dash dash web render, yeah. and you do it's, equal, and it, you can choose HTML um, that overrides the default of the canvas. The, and you can also run it with that as well. The link is actually for the documentation is in the chat. Um, once you, if you run it with a HTML one, then control F will search for widgets and find because they're actually text on the screen. So that'll fix your problem. Alrighty. Wait, hmm. wait, wait for it. Let's see, where did it go? I'm looking. Oh, come on. Suspense. 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 Well, Drum roll, please. Um, oh, clicked on the wrong thing. This there is, we go. This is, this is this is going badly, right? Yes. Another state <laughs> management. Yeah. I mean, we, we don't recommend one state management over another. Block has Not been... The and, well, the Flutter team kind of recommends provider. Provider and block have been, been recommended by the, by the Flutter team and by Google. But yeah, it just who, who cares who recommends what right go try it if it works for you there you go it works brilliant use it as as long as it's well written <laughs> and performs well not all of them do but uh, i i have to highlight the, this this i have to highlight this from craig thanks craig you, you, thanks you can come thanks, on here buddy. anytime and, and <laughs> we'll get right. you back on here again soon i threaten it okay um, <laughs> let's see here is there a way to get a bug addressed? Oh, I'm sorry. Right. My bad. All right. So there's. <laughs> there we go. Where can I file an issue? That's the one I was looking for. 
yeah, as I said, the, the GitHub repo. So yeah, I'll put a link in the chat for you. And as Randall said, the upper right hand corner of any of the docs leads you to a GitHub about that doc. And then um, you need to please also search for the issues, right? Making yeah. duplicate issues is not a thing we want. So search the issues, try really hard all the synonyms you can think of to try and find that no one else has reported that issue first. And if they have right. reported it, go in there, comment on that thing and thumbs it up and, and act to be part of the community. But just find Finding different combinations of... of words to do the search several times. Yeah. Yeah. There are thousands of issues. There are people who spend all day long digging through trying to triage these things. And I can't tell you the number of times they want to smash their keyboards because they've seen the same issue 12 times in an hour and it was already there. So, so let's see yes, here. Sir. Which it's good for adaptive application. Well, so far uh, we have the layout builder suggested um, and also, somebody mentioned tossing in aspect ratios with expanded in addition to layout builder. So there's actually uh, there's a couple of great packages. There's one called Breakpoint by Rody Davis, I think, and that allows you to to sort of manage the breakpoints you normally get in like most web based scenarios. Um, they that matches the material guidelines for breakpoints, if you remember rightly. The I'd say the um, if you want to do something yourself, yeah, layout builder just works. Um, but adaptive, adaptive widgets normally ref, the, the, think you're searching for the wrong thing. Um, oh, it's not, it's not called adaptive. So we have a thing in, in front called adaptive widgets, is which basically where uh, you switch out the widget based on the operating system. So if you're on web, you see a web based one. If you're on iOS, you see an iOS widget. If you're on Android, you see an Android widget, right? So that's adaptive widgets. So um, be careful what you, ask for so what you're actually looking for is 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 breakpoints and um is the common term used in web right so where you break the the page and it decides to change the layout you see here real quick and, and we're looking at there we go <laughs> breakpoint that's the one i was hurrying i was hurrying all right um, let's see here um is it obligatory that the contest project targets web? Um, highly suggested since it's focusing on web, uh, but Kelvin's got more on that. Kelvin? Yeah, ideally the project targets the web and there's a prize um, for projects that target um, desktop and mobile as well. Um, but at the base level, your your project should target the web. It's, it's it ends up being a lot easier if you can obviously uh, host, since you've got Firebase, free Firebase hosting, you can host the web, um, host the web for free. And and it means it's easier for judging. And, and it's also great for you to share to other people and show off your work, you know. And as we're talking about PWAs, you know, as we were saying earlier, you get the manifest, you get the install, and Firebase hosting is SSL. So you're going to get the nice install like icon and you can install that and it can it's an application right without any sort of app stores or anything getting in the way so okay. yeah Next. custom frameworks or xc frameworks to ios uh there's plenty of information on the website to do that and i mean i'm not i can't walk you through the steps but you can do it and there is actually information on um in fact you can go look at the first party plugins so if you go to GitHub slash flutter slash github.com slash flutter slash plugins. You'll find the first party plugins provided by the flutter team and they have frameworks and a couple of theirs. And you'll see that there's a pod, pod spec file, which allows you to specify the framework. Uh, and that will use the, uh, pods, uh, in, uh, was it pod install and all this kind of stuff to, to add the frameworks into the project comp compilation settings. Otherwise, you can add it manually into comp compilation settings for your plugin and ship it. I mean, it's perfectly reasonable. Um, the pod specs is, is the suggested mechanism. Alrighty. So, 
how can we make the first load faster in a Flutter web application? First of all, Christopher, thank you for saying web application <laughs> and not website. Right. Because the, the very first thing is don't try to build a whole website in Flutter. Okay, web, Flutter web is web apps. This is mainly yes. around this this SEO thing, and also you know it's still in development, so it's there's still a bit on the heavy side some certain things. So so it's going to get there. It's going to get there. Um, so I'm not sure if this is still current, but uh, deferred imports was the way to do it originally. Um, I haven't used deferred imports for a while, but it means that what you do inside your dark code, uh, you add the defer keyword and you give it as a name. And what this means is uh, whenever you want to load another, let's say you, your, your website or web app is broken up into four main sections, right? When you go to click on that second section and load it, what you can do is access the deferred import and then tell it to load and then show the page. So basically you're loading on demand. So rather than loading all four sections of your site up front in JavaScript, it will load only the, the section when you tap it. But deferred imports is like, it's free. It's, it's, it's free and open for you to do how you want. So I'm just suggesting sections, but they may turn out to be a terrible idea. You might, might have to loading spinner when you, whenever you switch tabs. I don't know. Like, like work out what works best for you. But deferred imports means that you have a, a limited amount of JavaScript being shipped down. First of all, uh, that's your main JS file, and then you have other JS files for the deferred imports, and they will be fetched and loaded in by the browser on demand. Uh, this and leave feedback on the. PWA implementation that helps prioritize and do, do you, our thing from our do, side. Do you have an issue ticket for that at the moment? Is that I that's don't. the I know that the SEO one. Do you have a number for it? I don't have for like. Okay, no problem. Uh, sorry, I'm search the issue tickets. Right, you'll you'll find it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, at the end of the day, the there's a lot still work being worked on and. The, it's together that we make this work. If you wanted to succeed, yeah, you know, work, work with us together, all your feedback, scenarios, information. Don't just post it, no work, right? Because that's not gonna that's not gonna help anyone, right? Examples, right? Examples. Here's the scenario. When I do this, this, and this, it causes this to happen, it breaks the PWA, whatever. Yeah, the more information the better. Right. Scott. When to focus on which platform. First of all, if you're writing professionally, whatever the client's paying you for. <laughs> right. Um, I mean, I mean, the thing is, from, from my perspective on this, um, and I, we're all going to talk from our personal sort of viewpoint on this thing. I'm sure Adriana is like, PWAs, everything's PWAs, right? Of course, of course, right? Um, and I think we'll, we'll come to that question in a second. Right. Everything's got a problem with Safari on iOS. Okay. It's not just PWAs. <laughs> um, the, that, by the way, that question is answered by using that HTML renderer. <laughs> there you go. Anyway, um, possibly. It depends. Right. Anyway, um, what was the previous question? You, 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 throwing us off, Scott. Bring it, leave it, bring it up uh, the screen. Let's see. Uh, nope, not that one. That <laughs> one. Yes, yes. So when to focus on PWO versus mobile. So again, it's like what makes best, but focus on something that gets you to through the So if this is an MVP, focus on whatever gets you there faster. If you're targeting, let's say I'm requiring, uh, I'm trying to think, let's say I'm requiring some hardware specific functionality and that's going to require a mobile device, then obviously you're going to go with that first, right? If you're, if you want to get something out the door quick, maybe PW is the answer for that, right? But at the end of the day, you kind of want you, you're you're surfacing a market, right? So there's a market for PWA, there's a market for mo for for the mobile apps. People go to the app stores. Um, they have their different amounts of market share, have different um, access, and that depends on your um, client base, right? So you won't know that until you launch. So whatever gets you to the market faster, if you're working with a MV, uh, you know, an MVP, um, it might be. As I said, if you're working on platform specific things, mobile works. If you're not working on any platform specific things, PWA might work. Um, there are obviously most of the plugins and most of the things that you're going to look go into on Flutter right now are, are directed to mobile. They're directed to Android and iOS first because it's the longest running platforms with, with Flutter. However, 
you know, if you're not using any of these extra things, then PWA mm -hmm. works. Go for it. Um, sorry, any of the others? Please, please step in. Like, if you want to comment on these that points, works. I'm right. just um, throwing out there. I, I'd love to hear Aaron, uh, Adrian's thoughts on that as well. Like, I I completely agree. Like, one of the beauty of PWAs and Flutter, as I said, is like you can choose whatever you like best, whatever serves your users best. And one of the things that I really like is this truly multi-platform synced um, experiences that you can do. I know the Flutter team has worked a lot on like creating beautiful UIs and all those sort of things. And maybe you can even uh, see the having a website and having an experience on desktops, just like a cherry on top, or maybe that should be your focus. It, totally depends on what you're doing and who you're serving. So think of your users and what they are asking you for. I will mention that, that you know, the reason why you have, a, we have Flutter and it targets all these different platforms, right? Is, so this is just the audience, not the audience specifically, um, is that, for example, desktop, right? So you, you can have a desktop PWA and you can have a desktop app. And the thing here is that a desktop app is going to have a lot less resource intensive and it's going to be other things because it's not a browser and you're not having to deal with working with the browser maybe to do certain things right like because that is a web world it's a different platform right so there can be advantages and disadvantages to using either in the pros and cons you have to weigh that based on what you're doing and that is development that is you know that is what you need to do um again you know if you need to help, there's the Flutter, the community is always out there, flutter.dev slash community. You can go ask your questions. And if you have a specific scenario saying, I'm trying to do this thing, and is it best that I do this on desktop first, web first, PWA, mobile, then you're probably going to get a reply from someone, right? But but just asking which one's best, it's like, it, it doesn't, it's not a question that can be answered, right? It's whatever works best for you. Sorry, okay. go so we can't entirely get away from HTML and JavaScript. Um, Dart is, I'm, yeah, well, the Dart is compiling to JavaScript. Uh, but in essence, really, if you're going to do something in pure Flutter, don't make the page too big. Because otherwise, you're going to end up with loading issues, potential performance issues. And when I say too big, you know, you don't want to do a whole site out of it. Uh, one page at a time. Sure. I think I think there's the thought that, that you know that you're getting if you're de developing for web you're developing with HTML and JavaScript uh, that that is the fundamentally the platform that web works on um, until all browsers support I mean originally I remember writing Visual Basic script this time shows you how I am when that was a thing so but until all browsers decide to to support another plat you know different language. I highly doubt that because they've been working heavily in optimizing JavaScript and everything else. But if that was to happen, then yeah, you're going to move away. But at the end of the day, anything else would be on top. But the great thing about this is Dart has a history with JavaScript. And what I mean by that is it was based as a potential replacement for JavaScript. That was way back you in the day. You make it sound like a bad marriage. Well, it didn't, it did, they, <laughs> they did stay together for very long. Um, so, but but a lot has changed in Dart, but it means that there, there is um, a similarity. That means that it, it's, it is fit to work on, on it for this purpose, right? Like it's not like trying to take C++ code and make it work into JavaScript, because that's just not going to happen. It doesn't work, it doesn't function the same way. Um, but also I'm, I'm sort of, I'm like all excited about what the future brings for web and Flutter with, ah, um, oh, I'm going to forget the name of it now. There's a there's a compiled target for web which will uh, generate say a type of bytecode that the browser can load. Uh, I'm forgetting the name of it. Are you talking about WebAssembly? Yes, WebAssembly. Sorry, that, that literally just escaped my mind. Yeah, so WebAssembly. So I know that the WASM. I know that the team is is got some targeting stuff with Dart to WASM, which again should improve that load speed and performance and other aspects to this. So uh, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Um, okay. okay, Simon needs to hurry. I'm out of coffee. <laughs> so, go, go all on. right. Um, next, this next one is actually, I've I've got a question about this for MA. So um, I I have to oh, go. Sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry. We're, 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 we're on here. It's been it's been an hour already. Blimey, where's time go? 
Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I have. No, 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 thank you for joining us. Over the um, years. It was a pleasure being here. Uh, contact me if you have any questions about PWAs. And mm -hmm. if you need me thank again, you, you know where to find me. Thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. And, uh, and yeah. her, your uh, Twitter is right there. If you happen to miss it on stream, well, it's YouTube. Scrub back and there, look at it. After it's in, she's linked gone. in the description below. Okay. Take care. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Okay. So now, um, okay, we lost Kelvin too. Okay. Kelvin's gone. <laughs> let's let's Alone go. Let's at go. last, Simon. So, so, Alone at last. So, um, yeah, uh, that's fine. I just want to mention that, yeah, we're answering general Q&A. Get your questions in the chat and um, uh, we'll see how far we go. Um, now, this one's rather interesting. I have a question for you, M.A. It says, can we get some guidance on porting libraries from other languages? My question is twofold. Number one, have you looked at other uh, packages that do similar things or give Dart capabilities that are similar? I and mean, two, if not, what are you trying to achieve? Because things I, like unions, sorry, sorry, but anything's like union types, data classes, they've been done with packages. But hold on, hold on, hold on. Like he's saying, can we port libraries, right? I mean, what? I mean, what is the library you're trying to port, right? That's the thing, right? Yeah. What, like, what are like, you trying to do? So, so, so porting normally means rewriting into another language. In this case, it would be rewrite for Dart. However, if your library is a C++ library, then you're going to have to compile it for the mobile platform. Then you can use FFI to communicate with it, right? So that kind of helps take down the amount of you know code. Uh, overhead to making your current library support uh, flutter. But most of the time, um, you're going to get the best performance by by recoding it in Dart. And the reason is Dart has a, uh, a, a GC that would work, probably work best for that scenario then, like you're going to get the most benefit out of the GC. And also, um, there's another point. That's point language. Oh, tree shaking compiler. Yes. So, 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 so for, from the perspective of, you know, uh, for that user, when they're using your library, if they're not using a, a bunch of functions from your library, that's not going to get compiled into their own product. Whereas when you're doing with FFI and you have a external library, they take an entire library. So example, mm -hmm. uh, there is a package on pub, which is M FFmpeg, right? So you can do video processing where well, you include a 30, I think it's about 32 megabyte, maybe 16 megabyte. I know it's a huge light binary library file for the entirety of the FFmpeg with all these codecs and everything else, right? For software rendering and all, all sorts, right? And then you have a very tiny bit of dark code on, on top of that for FFI. Well, you know, you're going to ship all that code no matter what. You can't cut out bits of that library. It's not compiled in dark. So hopefully that helps, but yeah. Righty. So here's uh, an, an interesting comment, okay? teaches naming stuff. If you're spending 75% of your day trying to figure out what on earth you're going to name something, you're normal. <laughs> and we get paid out, you know, and some days you feel like you get paid outrageous amounts of money to stare at the screen and try to figure out baby names. Um, the yeah. Joy is, <laughs> look, I, I would, I honestly would feel like I would teach any programmer to go learn synonyms, right? Whenever mm -hmm. you need to look up like, like, you know, you have a word like other, and you have to mention, you have to talk about other in certain concepts in this one piece of code multiple times. And you can't use that same term because it would mean you're talking about the other piece of the code. Start looking up synonyms, right? Because that's what so basically when you're coding, you want to have your IDE open and then a web browser with the docs <laughs> open in one tab and a thesaurus in the other tab. You do. I'll be honest with you, you do start learning more words and, and, and stuff when you do program. I think it does increase your vocabulary quite a lot, actually. Think about it. Yeah. Um, okay. Here's an interesting point that uh, we don't normally touch on, but it is actually the real reason that Remy came up with RiverPods, one of the biggest, is accessing your uh, values in provider is very difficult to do outside of the tree itself. And that's one of the main things that Remy was not happy about. 
So absolutely, yes, RiverPod, one of its main purposes in life is to make it easier to access those values outside of the tree. So now let's see here. Next one. Can you make a for each loop asynchronous? No. However, yes, you can, can make an asynchronous function containing a for each loop. No, you can make an asynchronous for loop. That's not for, that's for each. Yeah, no, same thing. For it's it's for in, in dot. Doesn't it, it yeah, you put is it a weight? You could do a weight async for, can't you, or something like that. If I remember right. Oh, it's been a while. Simon is confused. Someone write this down on the calendar. Um, it is January 26th. Literally, there's, there's, uh, hang on, four. And while he's looking this up, um, honestly, Edwin, you're going to need to do a Twitter poll on that one. I mean, I have the the people doing flutter web are kind of spread far and wide um i'm not sure there's enough information to really know what the main issues are other than load times in which case you need to break things up and use deferred imports um yeah but other than that just also make sure that your packages support web don't just grab any old package and don't assume that the ones you were using in your mobile app are going to support web. Um, well, I, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure you can, but you don't, I mean, there's plenty of ways of doing asynchronous for Make loops. an async function and put a for loop in it. So there's actually, I tell you the thing that most people forget, uh, there's future dot await or future dot wait. And that's for you, multiples though. Yeah. So the idea is that you, so, so you take your, your input that you're looping over your, it could be a function, whatever you map it into a set of futures and then you pass that set of futures to future dot wait. And what's going to happen is very particularly in darts case, it will run them in concurrent uh, concurrently in, in, sorry, it'll run them in parallel concurrently. Right. So, um, it will spin up enough, uh, uh, things to actually run them in parallel. So, so you're not going to be awaiting one and doing them serially. So you wait for, let's see each one of those, uh, futures was a network request you're not going to wait for one then loop around and wait for the next one then loop around and wait for the next one right you can actually process process them concurrently and then wait for them all to finish sorry go on um what state management does flutter itself use internally that's not, flutter is the tools okay flutter is not really it, it's not a application I think the problem here is state state management just being misused <laughs> yeah well and the funny i was joking around with chris sells about this i said you know state management actual management is going to be your logic that's what's changing your state determining what changes your state what we're calling state management is really more observer pattern and notifications I th yeah, well, this is it. Like, like it's, it's quite funny. It's like, like this. The answer to this question is, it calls a function. I mean, what state management isn't a fundamental part. It's it, you're using the basic language information like classes, interfaces, function callbacks, whatever else it is, to achieve whatever you want to achieve, right? So there is no magical state management. It just calls a function. Like the state object is there, and it just calls a function on it. There's no, you know, it's just that's the program right like yeah i mean now the the uh, randall's pointing out also that the uh the things that are built into the framework that are meant to be used are inherited widget and set state but those are the underlying uh mechanisms that are being used by other state management and also something you can use that a lot of uh there are some Flutter developers who really write with the low level things that are built into the framework. And I have seen people use animation builders uh, for yeah. that kind of an update. So, so. animation builder takes uh, with the animation parameters is actually a listenable. That means anything that's in the platform that's listenable, that's scroll controller. So you can have widgets rebuild when the scroll changes. You can have, um, there's actually a listenable dot merge. So you can actually listen to multiple things and have which is rebuilt when any one of these things change is all built into the framework 
uh, listable is the key is the key concept but that on top of that is built value listable a value notifier and change notifier and these are all things that are built into the platform that are used to 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 notify other widgets that that something's changed which are just function callbacks there's, there's no magic there so uh keep um, talking keep talking do we have another question <laughs> Uh, we have a um, we have another question. Basically, I'm also trying to look something up. Uh, can I nest two future builders? Can you? Of course, you can. Now, the other question, though, is I mean, it's like I ca I can't. Yeah, I can save fifty percent. Or no, I'm sorry, what was it that I say? I can get fifty percent off and double miles if I buy three day old sushi not a good idea um but handling multiple futures is definitely a question to be addressed here um so i will mention actually quickly on that point you can and if you do do it you need to make sure you're, you you give an initial data because what happens is let me explain if you have two two uh two nested uh uh future builders the outside one rebuilds and it's going to rebuild the one inside now if you want the same one inside to keep the same future you probably want to give it initial data so when it rebuilds the future it starts with it. otherwise you start seeing like double loading and you're losing your your widget state because it's rebuilding the entire ui so it is a known problem and in fact randall who's in the chat made a youtube video on the exact topic because we had this discussion and he made a youtube video about it so and he shows it and with some screen share now there's an interesting question that i have honest question i don't know the answer to this what if you created a variable let's say and i'm reading something right now off of stack overflow which is my first mistake um <laughs> but few final values equals await future dot wait and then it lists out your futures what if we used values as the future in the future builder because then the future builder wouldn't trigger until all futures are completed and we would still wouldn't have to nest them you just said future way too many times and i've lost track so i'm just going to nod and say yes sounds cool uh, try it see if you try like and it. see uh, but there is there is another point though what if you have something and it did, simon you and i worked on something like this a couple of weeks ago we wanted to load part of the page Bef while we were still waiting for another part so then what if that was nested what if you had a frame for the page right and then part a was one future and could load and then part b within that could load sure so that way you don't have to wait until they all finish to display anything but you display what you've got at the time as you get it okay okay um Did we miss some questions? Because I'm looking at some questions. No, we didn't. No. We didn't miss anything. But this is a question that we dance around a lot. Um, get no, it? No, it's not. The short no. version is we just don't go. recommend it. Period. I'm um, not going to talk. Not, a I lot of reasons. Any of my time to this? It's well, not happening. I Oh, let me finish. Yeah. <laughs> there are a lot of reasons. Um, they range from if you only know GetX. Now, if you only know GetX, you'll never be able to get a Flutter job. Now, if you know GetX in addition to the Flutter framework, you're fine. But if you know the Flutter framework in addition to GetX, you're probably not asking that question. Um but that's that's the main big one for most people if you're just doing a hobby project then okay you can use it um but don't expect great performance there are a ton of reasons for that that we really don't get into because then what happens is people who like getx get all angry and you know there are technical reasons we don't use it and we recommend knowing flutter first and then learning get x if you want and if you like it then go ahead and use it because you've already got the skills to do otherwise i'm i'm gonna zoom through some questions we have in the chat um thanks what for did, that um okay <laughs> right. um there are 2370 open issues 
you know um i'm surprised it's that few i was gonna say and i was gonna say I, i'm gonna ask another point why does why does the number matter that's my other point but it doesn't mean that there's 2370 bugs that's what that's in your imagination that means because there might be feature enhancements there might be requests there might be all sorts of other things and the side of it is how many of those are things that have already been fixed how many of duplicates how many of this how many of that mm -hmm. A number how, means how many fact, of them are typo suggestions? And, and I would go so far as to say the higher the number, the better, because yeah. and here's the interesting thing, because it means it's a more active repository, right? If, there, if there's a, re, hang on, if there, let's say there's, a, there's another package similar to uh, another cross platform over here, and it has 10, about 10 issues being raised a month, right? Not many people are using that. Not many people are interacting. Yeah, with, not many people are fixing look bugs. Look at how many. That. Look at how many are new and how many how they're fast. They're being closed. Not just that there's a big pile of issues, but you you want to see that they're being worked yeah. on and, and and they're being prioritized. They're active. Every yeah. issue goes through triage. You know, it it will. You know, the the number doesn't make a difference. It it, it purely doesn't. Right. Let let me. Do you mind if I take over the question? One here. Uh, well, uh, one, a couple real quick. I'm I'm actually back at uh, 47. Um, yeah. Real quick. Rumor that Flutter Web isn't good for sophisticated websites, but rather for web apps. That's not a rumor. That's a fact. And mm -hmm. that is what we have been actually advocating all along. So I don't think there's, I mean, it isn't good. Here's the thing. You could build it for a sophisticated website. Right, like, like, but then you're gonna have a, a lot. You're loading a bunch of JS for a website, which probably doesn't need it if you just got like loads of text, right? You're you're uh, also gonna get, get the SEO, and the SEO is the big piece here, right? So there's ways of optimizing that JavaScript, there's ways of doing stuff around that, and blah blah blah. But at the end of the day, is like we we're just talking about PWAs today. That is something that you download, that you install. It's an application. It is not the same as a website that you browse through. Like, like you know, you don't expect to go to a news website and have to sit there and wait for the news website to load. You want to see the content, read it, and get done, right? So, yeah, that's that's what we're talking about, the difference between a website and a web app. Um, okay. As far as community things go, you really want to reach out to Neelai Yenner. Um, you really just, just search Flutter Neelai. You can't miss her. She's everywhere. Uh, but she and, is actually working on Flutter meetups and community outreach right now. I'm just going to quickly, before we get jump on another one, I saw a couple of questions back. Raphael, uh, this, you don't have to bring it up. You won't find it. Raphael <laughs> said, uh, are there any moves to simplify Navigator 2.0? That's the Go router that we brought up earlier. Right. Um, that There's plenty of patches. And in fact, there's several Flutter favorites. Beamer is another one that are... Uh, a simp essentially simplifying. So the simplification is the wrong term here. They are they are frame they are frameworks. They are they are frameworks and abstractions on top of Navigator two. And the reason for Navigator two is and it's complicated is because we asked for it. So everyone was limited to Navigator one and did do all what we needed to do. So Navigator two said, "Here you go. Here's all the functionality we can give you, which is so much everyone's overloaded, right? But it was never meant for that. It was it was meant for this." For people to come along and do these patches like go router beamer and others to um facilitate that and make it easy and give a new mechanism so each one of those packages has a different way of doing navigation that might make more sense for you than others okay moving on sorry okay um number one i would say no this was not a lie uh for the past three and a half years people have been saying that 90 percent of your code can be reused and yes, you're going to probably have to adjust little bits here and there. So I don't know where you one got source that of idea, It was a lie. Yeah, I'm not sure. I get. I'm not sure. I get that. You can. I literally can go build one source code and have it work on both. And, and it depends on what you're doing. Sometimes there are platform specific things, but it's the exception, not the rule. Yeah. Um, this is going to be the same. With, so, so here's the thing, right? Imagine. Imagine uh we sorry i just want to give you a good example here nothing is going to solve that what you're expecting if you say one write one code and it works everywhere for everything it's the problem that a lot of frameworks a lot of things fell into and that is suddenly now i need to support gps on every possible device gps is put on inside flutter so that we get that directly inside flutter it's not going to work it just doesn't work that way, right like the platform yes. that, that that has already been bug tested fixed and everything else by the platform make best use of the platform 
right? And that's what the plugins do. The plugins let you attach your your platform agnostic code to your platform specific code being, being what the plugins use. So, And that's there's another interesting one that reminds me of a conversation I had with Matt Sullivan about three and a half years ago. Wow. Um, in short, at the time, I thought that Flutter was going to basically be the new Java and that it was going to kill the JRE, um, the Java runtime. So, and Matt and I were talking about it and he said, no, 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 no. And I asked him why. And he said, the reason was that the JRE has the code to interface with all the different kinds of hardware, all the different kinds of, let's say, webcams or cameras or all the different kinds of this, that, and the other, right? So he said, the Flutter team, A, does not have the mission to try to work with every single piece of hardware in the world. And it does not, uh, they don't definitely don't have the, uh, the staff to deal with that. So different things like that are going to be community plugins, as Simon was just saying. I can say also to mention that there is one piece of hardware that Flutter deals with, and that's the UI, right? So, so the one piece of the one piece of hardware is graphics, the right? canvas. Is, yeah. is, is the canvas that you're output to. But that's it. That's its only, like, I'm just trying to think about anything else you've got. And, oh, sorry. And uh, keyboard and device input and out, uh, you know, that kind of thing. So, so you know, mouse, keyboard, and, you know, touch screen. But that's it. That That's as far so, as it's going to go on, on terms. I can't see. Pushing this on. I can't we're, see we're at, audio or anything sorry. else coming under it. Anyway, go on. Yeah, sorry. We the reason I'm pushing it on is we're an hour and twenty minutes into yeah, the yeah, stream, we and we have a hard stop it too. Um, so yeah, I'm not trying to cut you off there on that question. Different. Okay. Um, you need to make it public just before you submit it. Is what would be my advice. So when do, if you're developing in a private GitHub repo, when do you need to make it public? And um, we are gonna we are gonna go through submission information uh, at a later date, and the information is all on the website, right? So if you go to the uh, the website, which I have completely lost right now, um, hang on, this one, and sign up. There's a resources page, and and you'll get given guidance about when to um, uh, when when and how to submit your project. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Interesting one. This is a Simon level question. Uh -oh. Go <laughs> Zach Rose, you're, you're making him think. Since, uh, since Chrome DevTools uh, doesn't display many useful things, not HTML, does it make Flutter web apps intrinsically safer than standard HTML? I think, I think sure I see what you're saying. It's, be, it's because, so, so when it's like, that we don't have traditional tags linking to traditional elements on the screen. So you it, it makes it harder that way to to reverse engineer the the website and to work out what it does. And safer in that way, sure. It's just obfuscation though, right? Like it doesn't stop anyone eventually getting down to what it does because it's all running on their client side, right? It's all running on the in their browser on the device. If someone wants to try hard enough, they'll find it. Yeah. Remember obfuscation is job security. <laughs> okay well you know you get me once he, a week he's already for... nash's hero <laughs> you only get me once a week on this or go sign up to the patron and we'll be do we're doing some streams on there so there you go um okay interesting permission handler that can be used for a pwa um that is a good question. So there is a permissions widget. Uh, there's a position, positions plugin. Um, and I don't know if it supports web. And I'm pretty sure, um, yeah, it's permission underscore handler by Baseflow. Um, I would go raise an issue ticket on their repo. There's the repo link. And um, Baseflow are really good developers. They've been working really hard with the community to produce a lot of really great open source uh, plugins. Um, I'm I'm sure they're happy if they haven't. We've got an issue though. They're interested in discussing um, supporting permissions on web and what that might mean. So go ahead, open up an issue ticket from. I know there is somewhere. Trying to find a particular question. Uh, no, I am trying to find where to upvote an issue. 
uh, there's a reaction button where you can thumbs up. Um, it is it moved around a bit, so there's a way of reacting to the top. You have to react to the first post, like the description, and there's a there's a thumb there's a react button that you can add a thumbs up uh, emoji to it. And there's normally if there's already a thumbs up emoji there, you just click on it and it adds it. Aha! Hang on a quick second here. All right. You have to zoom in. <laughs> yep, I'm zooming yeah. in. Okay. iOS simulator unavailable, blah, blah, blah. Right? When you go over here to the smiley face. Yeah, thumbs up. And, of course, the pop-up uh, that comes up, the dialog box with all the emojis, doesn't show on Zoom because it's only sharing that one window. No, we see it. We see it. You do see it? Oh. I'm sorry. It blocked by my camera. My camera's right here somewhere. Yeah. Anyway, go on. Right. All right. All right. We're moving. We're moving. We're moving. Quit shoving. Questions, questions, questions. We gotta go. Will isolates work on the web? Uh, that is a good question. Um, I haven't actually attempted that. Uh, I mean, you do get your standard isolate. There's no reason why they shouldn't work. Um, I would. I mean, they are message bound, which means they're not like inherently sort of thread bound. Um, there is, however, what if you do want to run something in the background, you can uh, Dart HTML, the built-in Dart. So if you go to API api.dart.dev and search, and you on the left-hand side, you see uh, Dart HTML. That's the HTML uh, DOM API and everything else to do with HTML. In there, you'll find the Web Workers API. So you can actually launch a, a worker. So you can actually compile your Dart code as a JavaScript file and load it in a worker. And that will give you definitely a background thread in the browser. That's what I'd say to that. I mean, the hitting, you're asking me if it works. Start an isolate, compile it, press play. Does it work? Great. Then it's then it works. Right? He tells me that all the time. Do you think we should do X? Do you think we should do Y? He's like, I don't know. Try put it. it in there. Put it in there and see if you get an exception and a crash. You know, and then Dart is very you. modern and we love it too. There you go. Yep. Okay. So <clears throat> I, I just so before we jump onto this question, I just saw this. Can I learn JavaScript easily after the uh, after learning of Dart? And the answer is probably not. It is very similar, but the type inference and type on safety and that truthy or falsy in JavaScript will just drive you insane. <laughs> the, here, here's the thing. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Um, once again, you know, I could save fifty percent and get double miles by buying three day old sushi. <laughs> why okay um network images how to work with network images required to do an html renderer but it messes up all the ui colors and other related stuff how to work with network images like the require like it's required to do html renderer but it messes up all the ui colors and related stuff never seen it before never seen it before um Raise it in, raise it as an issue ticket. Um, is this like, are you doing custom like it pixel manipulation? Then you probably got your RGB as BGR or it's backwards or something like that, which would mess up the colors. But unless you're just, if you're just loading standard images, colors should be fine. Um, yeah. I mean, actually, so the HTML render just uses the image tags, it's just your browser. Um, if you're using, I will mention this, if you're using the new JPEG standard, the advanced, I can't remember, is X265, is the new image standard. It's not supported by all, all, all stuff, and it's probably is going to screw up. So that just FYI. Bad. Okay. We're going to enter a new phase of the show. Okay. This is a new thing this week, but we're probably going to do it every week. Okay. We're going to play Let's Dump Simon. Oh, <laughs> Come on. Question, question, All question. Right. No. question, question, question. Um, let me see here. Uh, text wrap, thumbs up on this. Um, I'm going to just pick one out here. As well. I was just is, about to pick that one. Is debugging and deployment similar in web applications as it is mobile applications? Kind of. So you can still, so if you, you can still do breakpoints, but it's just you're dealing with an external browser. There is complications. And it is not as easy as it would be if you're just doing it <coughs> directly with with Dart uh, because of the trans 
sort of the compilation to JavaScript. Okay, future of if you Bluetooth want, low energy. Oh, sorry. If Go you ahead. wanted, if you want to do bare debugging, uh, enable the inspector in Chrome. And then you can actually like see the source code and it will map it. And then you can enable exceptions in there and some other. Essentially that you're mixing web debugging and dark debugging together can help sometimes. Anyway, and view the console. Go on. All right. Future of Bluetooth low energy. Now, in addition to anything that uh, we might be able to tell you here, also reach out to Super Declarative. Matt Carroll, I happen to know that he has worked with this in the past. I, and uh, he could have some interesting you, insights. The exact package I'll put in the chat Flutter underscore reactive underscore BLA. It is made by Philips Hue. You know the light bulbs? They're all Bluetooth low energy yep. and it's a very stable package. And they use it on all on all of their you know, millions of light bulbs sold. That, that is, and, the, and the mobile app is made in Flutter. The Philips Hue mobile app is made in Flutter. And uh, it uses this package they made as open source. So Use that. There you go. You got your answer. Okay. All right. Question about oh, porting libraries. Oh, go ahead. Thing. Talking about Bluetooth, it is inherently different on older devices. It will change on standards. There's bugs in certain stacks. That's Bluetooth. You'll just have to deal with that, right? Like it's a, it's that's the technology. So, but but they but by having one of these plugins, kind of abstract that away, you don't have to deal with that yourself. You're not dealing with a native platform. So come. Okay. A uh, question about porting libraries before is due to the fact that some packages require you to modify build.gradle, and this could break Firebase. Uh, it won't. There you go. So, so let me explain that. About that. <laughs> uh, let me explain that. So, so if you look at some of the other packages that we already have in, 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 so this is a problem we had in alpha. When we were first doing Flutter and stuff, we would always have to have problems with the Android package and everything else. So the key is, the, all the plugins should use API and not implementation when importing their dependencies. And this means that the main application can always overwrite them and it will do the dependency resolution and get the one with the correct version and do all this kind of fun stuff. So that solves a lot of the breaking changes there. And this might break Firebase packages. Um, I don't know what you mean by that, particularly in this case. So again, specifics and, and maybe we can help. But yeah, there's nothing inherently... Um, like again, that's not porting. What you're describing there is not why I consider porting. It's just making a plugin for for uh, you know you're just making a plugin for some existing Android or iOS code, and it has dependencies you need to put in the pod spec or Gradle. It's every plugin out there, every and you know um, Flutter plugin that supports mobile does that. So okay, okay, the nested futures. Was thinking about that the second future depends on data from the first so um in that case then, I, well what, what do you what do you think about actually nesting the futures but when the first one completes show something on the ui so that the user isn't just staring at it for a while in case it takes a while for yeah, both I mean, to complete is this is this is this two future builders thing or is this something else that's true that's true is it two future? well it's two futures but the second if it's one just, is depending so, on data. So here's the, the thing: yeah, you can have, you can have, you can make a function which is asynchronous that goes and waits for the first one, gets the result back, and then calls the second and waits for that. And you have one future, and you put that in your future builder, and then you can update your UI, right? Uh, that's that's not exactly, yeah. I mean, there's no that's need for a wait. So, so 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 to be clear, hang hang, can you get back to that? For a second. Uh, oh. That is. Let me just explain. This is saying, I want to await. The result of the then not the first bit it's it looks a bit confusing so basically it's saying future dot wait on all these futures then run this other future essentially what the values bit is and then await the result of that okay so probably not what you want in this case if it's okay. answering the previous question that is what's that, what's that? not much how about you man <laughs> oh right Okay. For a minute there, I thought I put somebody in timeout. Um, no. Okay. That is called a misclick. That's better. When to use an isolate? When to use an well, isolate? Um, 
I, I'll be honest with you. When, when you need I, asynchronous I, on steroids. So, so here's the thing. Puzzle, we'll, go, we'll go with Flutter Puzzle Hack. Let's say you're trying to prepare some data before, to, like, before you get to the puzzle to like, you know, do the puzzle something special. You might want to do it in the background. And I'll give you an example of this, um, something that um, someone asked me the other day, it's cutting up an image, right? You're processing that image. That's a computationally heavy operation. You still want the UI to be reactive. So you do that in a background isolate, right? So I'll give you an example. So when you, uh, the reason why you don't have this problem on the main isolate, that's where your UI has been done, when you do other things like fetching a file from the disk, or doing network, or any of these things, is they've done little chunks. So it does that in between managing the UI, and that's all done for you. That's, you know, um, whereas if you want to do one big computationally intensive thing, like multiple for loops inside each other, and it takes multiple seconds, well, then you don't want to freeze your UI for multiple seconds. So that's when you use an isolate. You then, once you have that problem, you then take that code and put in an isolate and then work out how to do the communication with the isolate. There's uh, new, easier mechanisms of doing that than previously before. Um, on the dark website, it goes through some details. But yeah, it, it's when you have a problem with like your UI pausing, then do it. If you're doing it before then, then you're doing it for no good reason. You're just giving yourself a headache. So yeah, not not many reasons to use isolates. Okay, so wait a minute. if you've got things that you're doing with futures, then you might want to use then, and then you're, never mind. <laughs> Um, what's a doodle? Have sort of web ever been used as a Google doodle? That's the, um, you know, when you're on the Google homepage and they, they change the search bar a little bit to, to do some little fancy have, animation or something. I think that's what it is. Google doesn't tell us what they do. Trust me. Yeah. Um, you can make whatever theme you want. So. Yeah. Do and, everything you want for the puzzle for the puzzle hack. Go right ahead. Oh, well, I would suggest not making it adult themed. Uh, you're probably yeah, that, not going to win that, at that, that point. That, that, there are rules, and the rules are now, explained on the website. It, here's but, yeah, an no, interesting vision, one. Hero, it, it, but an interesting point. It's Randall had brought up something, and I don't want to steal Randall's idea. Okay? <gasps> we were joking around about making the Jimmy Buffett app, and it's a very simple little app that uh, it looks at the Jimmy Buffett song, it's five o'clock somewhere. So it tells you wherever it's five o'clock. Okay. So it tells you where it's quitting time and it's time to go drink. <laughs> you could make your puzzle. Okay. Show wherever it's five o'clock. So that means that the solution for your puzzle will be dynamic. And hopefully it will not change in the middle of the user. I I, to do the I was literally just thinking it would be so cool to have a puzzle that shows the active time and the, and the bits of the puzzle change as the time changes. That would be so difficult and so cool at the same time. Okay, a lot of you are going to try to do that. So at least try to make it look cool in ways that are different from other people. I mean, doing doing the time like that is all for all right for a lot of... I kind of just want to go um, ahead and make it right now. I, I've, got, I've got the urge. Oh Gone. man, you've got code reviews to do. I've always got code reviews to do. Yeah, I know. I write code. <laughs> code push. Anyway. Currently, Flutter does for code push internally. Is there a chance to have this feature in the future? If not, then how can we achieve this? Um. Yes. So, code push. Let me just explain that for people that don't understand. So this is about updating your code live over the wire. So let me give an example. At the moment, you have, let's say you have an Android app in the App Store, and then something goes, you know, and you want to change the UI. At the moment, you recompile the app, you then ship it in, an, in a bundle or APK, and it gets shipped to the App Store, and the App Store downloads it to the user's device, right? The idea of uh, code push is over the air, you can push the code, you, you're ready, you, you push live, and it sends it out to the devices, straight to the devices. That might be plenty of ways of doing like sending data out to devices, like push notifications, and the push notification goes and fetches some data. There's all sorts, right? Anyway, um, so code push is about updating your your application on the fly. That is against the rules on iOS. Step one, you cannot do that on iOS. Um, that is against their TOS 
terms of service. So you will get into very big trouble by doing that. Um, it's very weird because, and we're going to take a step back, PWA, on the other hand, is a different thing. So with PWA or web-based app, then what you've got going on... <laughs> I'm being reminded that the, show, that the show needs to end yeah. soon. So... Um, Come on, come on, right. Um, so, so, so uh, with PWA, it will uh, the web the web browser will access the content all the time. It's the same as if you have a web view inside your app. It will access that content and get the latest one all the time. So that's more like code fetch, if you will. But um, I don't know if Flutter will ever support code push. It's not as far as I know, but not. You can achieve similar things though. So, so you can do like um, layers of of. Um, like uh uh oh my god what description language you can actually there's actually a flutter js package which lets you put javascript it ships the javascript engine with flutter so you can then you can update javascript on the fly and there's there's various other mechanisms doing this but again as i said it's again as far as i remember it's against the rules of the terms of service on, on um on on apple's uh place uh, app store so but on desktop you could do it and on um uh and definitely on web, as I said, it's free, it comes free of charge on web. PWAs automatically do that, essentially. Um, I would be wary of doing it at, at all because it gives you an... Uh, uh, you have to sign your code pushes, right? So I know that I'll just cover this. You don't want... Imagine you've, you're running an app at home on your desktop right now, and suddenly it just gets sent code and runs it. I mean, that's not like, you know... It's not... It's a, it's a huge security problem, right? So you want to make sure it's code signed and... It can be the app verifies it's from the creators of the app. I mean, it's it's a whole thing around this that it's complicated. So yeah, you could do it, but I don't know. It just seems a lot of effort for for not a lot of reward. I can't think of many many situations that require it. Okay. Are there is there a suggested path? Um, and especially that's framework only. I don't think anybody's done one that's framework only. However, there is, is the highly subjective roadmap, um, which is actually quite good. I, I do have to I, say it's quite good. I would honestly, the way I suggest, oh, you want to bring up? Okay, good for it. Yeah. Yeah. So. This is the highly subjective, highly subjective roadmap to Flutter development. I, um, I, I also think like at the end of the day, um, I would go pick something you a target of what you want to do. There's a great example I saw recently of um, Mike. I think his name is Mike Boyd on YouTube. He did a um, magic calculator in Flutter, and he wanted to build this to trick his friends. So, and he was suggested Flutter. He just wanted to build an app. He suggested Flutter and he went ahead and did this. But he had a target, right? So he was saying, I want to build this and had something to aim for, which meant he then learned everything he needed to do to get to that point. If you're just trying to learn abstractly and say, I want to learn all the topics in Flutter, you've not, no, you don't know where to turn, right? Mm -hmm. you, you, there's so many things to look at, so many avenues. Well, that's, I, I had that problem for a long time, you remember. It's, yeah. it's hard to figure out how to structure your learning when you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And it's, you're shooting in the I dark. Right. Um, yeah. So mainly the things that I would focus on is the basic widgets and focus on layouts, um, things like text and images. Make sure you understand those very well and really dig into the flex class which is the super class of rowan connell um this is where it can get confusing and take your time okay because the flex with a capital f is the super class of rowan column there is also a flexible which is the super class of the expanded however the flexible and the expanded have a parameter called flex which is a small f uh, so don't confuse the flex with the flex in a flexible because you know the flex can flex <laughs> it is flexible but it's not a flexible and the the strength of the flexible depends on the flex and just don't confuse it with flow <laughs> right so yeah don't confuse the flex with the flex or you're going to be flux right but anyway yeah that uh okay boy we get this one a lot 
is there a way to secure this yeah, IPI keys in Flutter in such a way that if someone extracts data from ABK, they cannot see it? No, um, so, so inherently, API keys. So, so first of all, API keys are public. They're there for the client to connect, right? So, if someone, I mean, the the, the API key itself is not the protection. The API key is part of the protection, right? It links it links the remote to your client, but that's all it's doing. Inherently, like for example, Google API keys will check the signature of the app, and there's other things that go on there. So, um, fundamentally, no. Um, but what you can do is just simply like if you're including them as strings inside your dark code, it's compiled into a big binary, and it's very difficult to it's quite often it's very difficult to get them out. You can of course encrypt those strings and there's just standard encryption there's a crypto crypto dart library pub package called crypto and you can just encrypt them with a pri private key pub private key just something um i don't know um I'm trying to think of a uh i forget one of the basic crypto mechanisms that are in there but basically you can ship just you know a 16 byte or you know a 32 character hex character string inside your app which is the key and then you can just you know, decrypt the strings on the fly if you want to, but eh, I don't see that you're getting any benefit from that. Like, like if someone wants to get in there and extract them, they're going to extract them. It's not the key itself is not the protection, right? If you start, the, the idea is that you want to be able to. Uh, a lot of the time, people do this thing where, in fact, you can do this quite easily with a Flutter app with, um, sorry, with Firebase, and that's with remote config. You have a remote config which has your API keys, and then your app goes and fetches them. So if you need to, if your API key is leaked, uh, or you know, or someone starts abusing it in some fashion, it's not coming from your app, and it's not going to protections I'm talking about. Then you can go update in your remote config, and then the next time the app loads, it'll go fetch the mo most recent API key. Okay. We are going to need to move quickly because the dog desperately needs emptied. Um, right. And unfortunately, the lady no, of the that, house it's... is in a very important meeting. So, right. okay. Um, that was, you wrote that at 118. At 118, I hadn't missed any by now. Yeah, I've missed a lot. Um, uh, let's, let's... Okay. And yes, you can. Um, but basically, yes, you can do whatever theme you want whatever theme uh, you feel is just, I mean, basically whatever inspires you. Um, what big bucks Google doesn't have. Uh, we don't get any money from Google, just like some friends of mine who run a liberal podcast, never get any money from George Soros. Uh, let's see here. Okay. That's a political joke. Let's, let's, let's just, let's in, just, I'm yeah. going to see anyway. forward to some people feel Google doesn't spend enough on Flutter. Um, I think Tim Sneath might agree with you on that one. I mean, I, obviously, like anyone who's involved wants it to spend more. However, they are recruiting right now. They are really beefing it up. Yes. So, you know, we can only hope more from the pipeline. I'm going to pick out this one. Not not a question, but okay. just want to point out that Flutter Discord yes. has been very useful. It is this Discord, Stack Overflow, the yep. public Slack. They're all on flutter.dev slash community. And you'll find them all there. Luke and crew over there are great. Yeah, Luke and oh, everyone. Um, my my yo yo is over there as well on the on the yep. Discord. Um, like I said, to we all went back to Firebase, but it's working definitely on build. But as I reload the page, it fixed all problems. Okay, so let me explain what's happening here. So there, if you look at that inspect in in your browser, you'll find that it's using a web worker. The web worker downloads the new code from the browser and then on the next reload, it then uses it. So it takes two refreshes to get that new code. And this is the same with all the other websites you see that are PWAs, except they tell the user, they pop up with, there's an update, press this button and it just refreshes the web page, right? So, so you can actually do that. There is code about um, accessing the web worker and see if there's an update and you can present the user with an update box. We did it for the Flutter Hackathon, so I know it's in there. Um, again, as um, I'm going to forget her name, uh, Adriana, uh, as Adriana mentioned earlier in the chat, they're updating the worker, they're improving it, and hopefully this is going to be one of the points they're going to pick up on. Right, next question. Um, it might be Flutter 3 drop considering the current pace. Somewhere in the future. <laughs> Why yeah. big numbers like one of the what is the solution to avoid it? Okay. Are you talking about web browser? 
Because if you're talking about web browsers, it's mainly because you've got to load data. It's nothing to do with the UI. You're loading data for 100,000 items in your browser. I mean, that's just yeah. nuts, right? You, you just use, like, let's say 100,000 items, and it costs you, in memory-wise, uh, 10 kilobytes. Well, let's say 100 kilobytes each. Then you just say you have 10 gigabytes of RAM, right? Like, like it's it doesn't well, make there, sense. There's two, there's two types too. Now, first of all, are you saying that it lags because it takes a while before it displays the list at all? Or are you saying that it lags when you scroll? Um, either way, really um, take a look. Oh, it might take me a little bit to find this, but there is a boring show with Philip and Ian Hickson where they talk about slivers. Look that up, the Flutter Boring Show oh, uh, on the Flutter channel on YouTube. And they're talking about slivers and they really go into this and why it's important to use slivers for lazy loading. Yeah, I would say ca caveat with, with don't paginate. Your, you're going to have to paginate some of your stuff. That's what all browsers, all, all websites do. They paginate because you can only load so much data in the browser without it getting laggy because it's an extra layer of abstraction. Uh, adding Firebase Core app to my... Uh, adding Firebase Core app size included by seven meg i guess that means it, it grew to seven megas yes it is in fact every android app as well because you're now including the entire firebase core in your app which is seven meg right or it's four meg or whatever the the added size is that is standardly normal there's nothing from here it's not flutter specific it's because you're including now the so you're doing on android it's the android uh module for firebase and um uh yeah uh -huh. um and then um you know, uh, iOS includes the iOS libraries and so on. And they are quite big because they do a lot, right? And this one I mentioned earlier, they're not written in Dart, so they'll get tree shaken. So you include all this extra functionality you're not using. But that's the price you pay for using, like, an external package like that. So, you know, um, wherever possible. Okay. Shader warm-ups for iOS. This has been a little a, a topic that's not known to everybody, but it is certainly known it's to people who have dealt <laughs> Mr. with Mr. Q. <laughs> to say what? I, I didn't miss it because it's not it got Q on it. Anyway, yeah, there's there's a web page. Uh, yeah, reduce shader compilation, Jake on mobile. Yeah, that's the one. Yep, and that's there's that right there. So that's um, what so he's that's what that. he's that's what he's uh, that's what he's talking about here. I would mention mm -hmm. that they have actually been improving the shader stuff, and there's actually yes a lot of happening with shaders inside the Flutter engine itself at the moment. That is all aiming to sort this out. And they did a big bunch in the last uh, in the last push and the last stable that came. In fact, the last two stables that came out have had 2.5 and 2.8. Both had huge inclusions and improvements around this. Um, and as Eric Seidel, Eric Seidel is the lead engineer, uh, and I'm not sure what the difference is here. I believe Eric's the lead engineer and Hixie is the tech lead. Um, but actually, I was going to show one more there. Okay. Um, this is what happens when two people can control the stream. Anyway, um, as Eric was saying, there have been tremendous improvements in the iOS jank. Uh, and the shaders issue, but he's still not completely happy with it. So they've made great strides and they are not done. Um, also, here you go. Last questions. This one, Warm post in the chat. Look at this. It will help you. What? There we go. What? I'm saying post the link in the chat and then you can tell. They, I'm working on it. They, that will help you. Right. Maybe not. Where are we? Um, Q, Q, Q. Completely easy fly. Can I learn the useful in one month? And I still try. Uh, yes, you can. You can learn a lot in a short amount of time. And especially with Flutter because of the hot rate and hot risk that kind of gives you that sort of instant feedback. Um, go for it. I mean, look, the, the end of the day is, and, you know, at the very beginning, any programming is difficult because it's, an, I mean, it's, it's not programming. It's any, there's any way to learn something, a new skill. It's going to be learned because it's going to be hard to learn because you you don't know anything about that topic and it's it's like it feels like you're biting your head against the wall and you like you know that you're trying to get through it but once you get over those humps and things start clicking and coming together it'll be good and the thing is honestly there's nothing like when you're when you're first making when you're first developing and you build that app and it delivers it to the play store and you see other people downloading it that is that's a really great feeling when you see that other people can make use of the code that you wrote that's that's hugely powerful 
Now, one person was asking if you would be their mentor, and this guy I know considers no. you his hero. No. Oh, no, no, no. no. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Right. Uh, can, we, uh, can you keep the Git puzzle code and write your own puzzle, not the same slide concept? Um, I think the idea is to augment the slide puzzle. Um, if you want to do a different type of puzzle, I, I mean, check the rules on the website. And we should have asked this when, when Calvin was here. I couldn't tell you for certain. Um, but you know what? You know, it's it's about the... It's all about the fun of this thing, right? Like, do it if you feel like you want to do it for fun, and you know, uh, we'll see, see what happens, right? Okay. And Danny, this looks like to me like there might be a problem with your installation, um, especially if you're having this happen on the default counter app. Um. So, so when you yeah. run when you run your app, you can specify. Yes, it's Flutter devices will list the devices. If it does not list any Android AVD emulators, it means you have not installed the Android SDK correctly. You need to have the Android SDK bin directory, uh, tools directory, and a few others in your path. That's all in the setup instructions on on, on installing uh, Android. Right, right. We kind of get through the last question quickly. Right, is there advice for submitting early? Yeah. Unmute you your mic. It's no. Good. <laughs> Sorry, if I'm just submitting early, early especially when it's, if if someone else had the same idea. No, I don't no. think so. They're all they're all evaluated the same. Can we expect future run the Chrome Safari Edge? Can we run the app on Android iOS? Yes, you can. I mean, you know, the dash D web server. If you do dash D web server, you can then. If you dash D web server, then you can uh, load it up in, in Safari or, or, or anything I understand. else. I understand. <laughs> is mandatory to include roaming animations? No. The dog's name is Karma. Mm -hmm. and, she's providing uh, Karma yeah, right she's, now. Come on. She gets away with a lot because she's had a bad life before she came here. <laughs> right. We, we, we get to the end here. Uh, oh, these are, these are the links. Okay. Um, yes. How to connect Flutter to Firebird server. Um, what's a Firebird server? I have no idea. No. No, um, but um, is that, could that be a cores issue? I think this might be a translation issue. Um, oh, I think it too. means maybe to a web server. Uh, you just you, you build your website with Flutter build, and then you can then take the build folder. It's in build web in the folders, take the entire folder, and then you can upload it to your hosting, you know, it, for example, uh, Firebase hosting or somewhere else and get her pages, all sorts, and that will make it public. Um, um, you shouldn't have a problem like that with a list view builder. Now, so if, if I, you are, I would make sure I, I tell you what I'd say. Make sure you have, most, have the most recent version of, of, of Flutter stable and you've upgraded Flutter. Um, that too. I, obviously, I um, can see and this also here. check out that slivers. No, I mean, no, what I'm trying to say, list view builder uses slivers. So if he's using a list view Under builder, the hood, then it's yes. getting slivers, so it shouldn't be a problem. Um, right. The, the dog wants to go out. Not he's not. he's She's not hungry. Right. Um, right. I think that's it. Yes. Wave goodbye. We made it. We made it. That's it. That's it. That's it. Thank you very much, guys. And um, we we've got through all the questions this week. We finally got through the questions. It in is one, week. one hour and fifty nine minutes into the stream. Oh, we survived. We survived. Just just enough, <laughs> right? Um, so next week we'll be back with some uh, with another guest. Uh, next week is uh, Rive Animations. So those who talk yes. us about Rive, come back next week. We'll be talking about animations in flutter and rive as well and we have some and because people. i'm sorry but w because we were in a hurry i did put up the question about is it mandatory to use rive in your contest no no it is no. not however you know what yeah you know, rive animations there's a plug-in there's animations free sure. make it make it all all sparkling good right right well we'll see you next time see you next week and Bye. with that we'll see you